Hello and welcome to Tony Broom Ministries. Here is a session from Psalm 51. God has included this psalm in the Bible to let us know that no matter how low you go, there's still hope and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. The title of this session is God Forgives the Penitent. We're in Psalm 51 today. This is a good psalm. I'm glad that Psalm 51 is included in God's Word. This was a low time in David's life, probably the lowest time in the life of King David. He did some things he shouldn't have done. He made some decisions he shouldn't have made. And on and on you could go. The good news is, as the title says, God forgives the penitent. Penitent means someone who repents. I'm glad that when we repent and when we get right with God, He does forgive us. And He will allow us the opportunity to repent. God shouldn't have had anything to do with us, but He did. He didn't have to, but He did. And He could have said, well, I'll give you a chance. But if you mess up, that's it. And God didn't do that. He gives us opportunity to repent when we've messed up, when we've sinned against God, we can repent, we can come back to God. God lovingly forgives those who repent of their sins. And he does it through love. It's not like some people present God and Jesus in heaven and Jesus said, all right, Father, they repented and God said, okay, I guess I'll have to forgive them. That's not the way it is at all. God is the one who initiated all this thing of love and forgiveness and mercy. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God is the one who loved us to start with. He's the one who made provision where we could be saved, where we could be healed, we could be forgiven. All this is a wonderful gift and provision of God. So God is not have to have his arm twisted to forgive us. He wants to forgive us. He wants to take us back. And I want to present this today in such a way that I hope that I can encourage the body of Christ. First of all, I want to encourage us not to do what David did. Certainly. And I'm not implying that you do, but I am implying that we can. There's not a man, there's not a woman in here that doesn't have the capacity to do what King David did. If David did it, you and I, under the same similar circumstances, can do it and probably would do it if that opportunity presented itself. I'd like to think that all of us are like Joseph in the Old Testament. We have just had a character just run away and not do anything. Sadly, that's not the case. And our golden text is in Verse 17 of Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. This is what God is looking for. He is looking for not a proud spirit, but a broken spirit. He's looking for a contrite heart. And another word that describes contrite is humility, an humble heart. We cannot come before God with a proud heart saying, God, you know me and you got a good thing going and you understand how I feel and you know all about it. And Well, the thing is, we don't reason with God like that. We reason with God the same way that David did. And I really want us to look all of this psalm, especially the first six verses as we get started talking about God, have mercy on me. That's the way that David presented himself to the Lord. And of course you know that this psalm, some Bibles, again, do not have the headings that are listed anymore. But your old Bible still do. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. So you may not know that this is the setting for this psalm unless you would hear that heading read. This psalm was written after Nathan confronted David about his sin. And he came to him and he told him this story about this rich man having all these flocks and herds and 
this traveler came to him and he spared to take of his own flocks and herds, but he took this poor man's little ewe lamb that had been brought up with him and his children and had grown up with his children and drank from his cup and laid in his lap and treated the little lamb like a little daughter. And this rich man who had plenty of livestock and plenty of sheep and herds and he could have taken any of those to feed this traveler, he snatched and seized this poor man's little lamb to feed the traveler with. Just a shameful thing. David became so angry. The man who has done this will surely die and he will pay fourfold. And Nathan, as many preachers like to present it, sticks that bony finger in David's face and says, Thou art the man. And in English, thou art the man, and the art has to be there to make it sound right, but in Hebrew, it's atah adam you the man. Or as the young folks say, you the man. David, you the man. You're the one who has sinned against God. And he told him, of course, what he had done. David said, I have sinned against the Lord. Now David and King Saul both had experienced the Holy Spirit, and both of them had times in their life when they sinned, but they were drastically different in the way that they came face to face and they came back to God. Saul resented the Lord, and he didn't own up to his sin. David confessed his sin to God, and he got right with God. Saul was rejected, and David was received. So both of them experienced these things in their life, not the same things, but they both experienced sinful times in their life. And really, David was worse than Saul, if you want to go by the worseness of the events that took place. But David got right with God, whereas Saul did not. And so David begins to talk to the Lord about his mercy, having mercy on him. And he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. He calls on God to have mercy on him. And as I was saying before, he didn't come to God and say, well, you know, Lord, the reason for this is when I was six years old at McDonald's, they stole my French fries and my third grade teacher didn't like me and I was black or I was white or I came from L.A. or I was in New York and they all these excuses that these people give now to be what they are and to do what they do. David didn't do any of that. He just says, Lord, have mercy on me. When we are confronted with our sin, the worst thing we could do is to try to justify our sin because that's not going to fly in the face of God. God's done got up a whole lot earlier than we have this morning and we cannot reason with him in that way. When he said, come and let's reason together, the only reasoning was him. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be like wool. He is the one who has the reasoning. If we come to God, we must come on his terms, and we must come before him. And David didn't come to try to be proud. All the game playing was over. All the running and hiding was over. He just said, God, have mercy on me. According to your loving kindness, blot out my transgressions. And this expression, blot out, he uses it several times in this psalm. Blot out my transgressions. David knew that his sin had to be dealt with, but before his sin could be dealt with, and in the process of his sin being dealt with, he had to approach and beseech the mercy of God. We have to come before God as his mercy allows us to. What did the blind man say to Christ in the New Testament? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What did the one who prayed, you know, the Pharisee and the sinner, and they prayed in the temple, and 
Pharisee did fasting and he did all this and I'm thinking that I'm not like other men or like this publican. Well, what did the publican pray? He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this is the one who went down to his house justified rather than the other. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. As I approach the mercy of God, I realize that my sin, this putrefying sin, this ugly and ungodly sin has to be dealt with and I need a good washing. Sometimes even as Christians, we need a good Holy Ghost washing of God's hose pipe of grace. Just come under God's hose pipe and let him wash you off. Because it's not that we're so bad and we've done things so bad and maybe not half as bad as King David did, but we all need a washing. We need to be washed because we live in a filthy world. Pastor Ronnie talked about that the other evening. Even if you have not done anything openly wrong in sin, just by living in the world that we live in, we need to be washed. Wash me thoroughly. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. It's like a seaweed around my head. It's like a looming thing that's just hanging on to me. It's like a spider web. I can't get away from it. It's continually before me. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions unto the Lord. My sin is ever before me. And then he says, against thee. Oh yeah, against Bathsheba, against Uriah, against Israel, against Joab, against all these people. You could say that he sinned against them, but he says when it really comes down to it, when it really boils down to it, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. It's really against you that I've sinned. And when God confronted David with his sin, that's one of the things he told David. He says, David, you have despised me. You have cast my commandment behind your back. You turned your back on me, and that's what David did. When David made the choice that he made, he turned his back on God. And these people and preachers that present David as a man after God's own heart, yes, David is a man after God's own heart. But in that time in his life, when he did the awful thing that he did, he was not a man after God's heart, for he had turned his heart away from God. When you turn your heart away from God, you're not after God's heart. God doesn't turn. We're the ones who turn. And if God turns, if you want to think about it in that way, it's because of our sin that he cannot look with favor upon our sin. Therefore, he has to turn his face away. David said, whatever you do to me, you have a right to do it. Whatever you say, I've sinned against you. I've done this evil in your sight that you might be justified when you speak. Whatever you say, I'm guilty. And be clear when you judge. Whatever judgment you mete out, I deserve it and more. There again, we in our educated and high class society, we've gotten to the point now where we like to justify ourselves and say, well, Really, it's not all that bad, Lord. After all, you know, I'm no worse than all the hypocrites in the church, and I haven't done as bad as so-and-so. I'm not a Ted Bundy, and I'm not a Boston Strangler, and I haven't raped anybody. I haven't robbed anybody. I haven't uh, done all these evil things. I haven't shaken anybody up and break anybody's house. But God says we still sin against God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Instead of saying, I'm no worse or better than anybody else, actually, that's right, we're no better than anybody else. But the fact is, instead of trying to put ourselves up and say, well, I'm no worse than anybody else, we have to come clean with God. David didn't try to prop himself up on a pedestal. He didn't try to reason himself out of this thing. He said, I've sinned against you, whatever you say, you have a right to say it. Whatever you do and judge, you have a right to do it. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's poetic language, but actually all it means is I was born in sin. That is, I was born a sinner. All these little pretty, innocent 
babies, we say. No, they're not pretty, innocent babies. I've heard people say, now I'll just have to take you all's word for it, that there's actually really no pretty babies. They all kind of look ugly when they're born. Most of them don't have no hair like I do now. And they are just a, a sight to behold. And they're pretty because we think they're pretty. We love them. They are children. They are grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We love them, of course. And they're beautiful to us. But actually, they wouldn't make a modeling contest. Most babies are just kind of blah, blah to look at. There's nothing shaped up and pretty about them. David said, you talk about my shape. I was shaping in iniquity and sin. Did my mother conceive me? In other words, I was not a born anointed king. I was not born in the Christian. You may have been born in a Christian family, but you were not born a Christian. You're not born a Christian. You're born again and become a Christian. I was born in sin, and if you allow this sin to live out, that's just what's going to happen. You don't have to teach Johnny to lie. You have to teach him not to lie because lying, stealing, theft, all this other is inbred and inbred and born in them. It's our Adamic nature. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. It's not all done yet. Some people think that David came to God and said, okay, I did wrong. God said, okay, keep on trucking, that's all right. It's not exactly the way it happened. Yes, God can forgive you in a moment. In a split second, God can forgive you. But this thing took time. David didn't do this in 10 minutes. It was a process. And he didn't get right, all the way right, in a minute either. It took some time. David was dealing with his sin. I know that my sin has to be dealt with. I know that it requires truth in the inward part and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. God, have mercy on me. Lord, cleanse me. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. There's a song that's written about it that says that. But the hyssop, they would take the hyssop, the Old Testament, God says you dip the hyssop in the blood of the lamb and apply it to the doorposts. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This hyssop was dipped in something and you would apply it with the hyssop. And David says, purge me with hyssop and wash me and I will be whiter than snow. What is he implying here? I'll tell you what he's implying. David didn't know about the blood of Christ, but he knew about the cleansing power of what the blood sacrifice would do. David was asking God to, as it were, take the blood and to wash him and make him clean. Because just rubbing hyssop over him would not do any good. But when God used that hyssop to apply the atoning mercy and grace of his love, then he would, he could, and he should, and he would be clean. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that thou hast broken may rejoice. Here poetically, again, it is very doubtful that God crushed him and broke his bones, but he was just saying in such a way, look, I'm broken. I'm devastated. I'm in terrible shape. Cause me to hear joy and gladness. David knew what it was to sing and to rejoice and to be in the presence of God and the anointing. And he missed that fellowship with God. He missed the joy and the gladness. And I don't care what kind of man you are in here this morning, what kind of woman you are in here this morning. You can get mad at the church. You can get mad at the preacher. You can get your feelings hurt. And we should not, hopefully to God we won't, but I'm telling you, you can go away from the church, but you will not get away. You will miss that fellowship of God. If you've ever had fellowship with God, if you have ever known the joy of your salvation, you'll miss it. You might get back out on the dance floor. Most of us are too old to make a good sinner, so don't even think about it. 
you might get out in the world and start raising hell again. Excuse the language. But the thing is, you're going to miss that fellowship. If you've ever known Jesus Christ, if you can do that without being whipped, Hebrews, i got another bad word, I'm sorry, it's Sunday for bad words. Hebrews says you're a bastard, not a son. If you can go through life and you have claimed to be a Christian and you don't experience the chastisement of God, then you are illegitimate and you're not a true son. But if you are a true son or a daughter of God, if you go away from God, you are going to get a honey whooping. He's going to lay the hickory to your behuckas. That's a wonderful thing. We ought to be glad that God loves us enough to whip us and to discipline us when we do wrong. Oh, I love my child. I can't whip him. No, God says I love you enough to whip you. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones that thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out. There is either again all mine iniquities. I need for you to blot them out. I need for you to take them away. And I need for you to hide your face from my sins. Lord, cleanse me. And David here makes a statement that is so fantastic. Not only do I say, Lord, just help me and Lord, forgive me, but he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create. Give me this clean heart. Create a clean heart in me, O God. I've gotten to have a wicked heart. My heart has become hard. My heart has become callous. My heart has become cold because of sin. And I need for you to create a clean heart in me, O God, and renew this right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David knew what it was to have fellowship with God. And now that fellowship is broken. You may be here today, and you may have the persuasion that once saved, always saved. Now I want you to know our church does not believe that. The IPHC, the International Pentecostal Holiness Church, and South Henderson Pentecostal Holiness Church does not teach or believe that. But you may have that persuasion. But whether you do or not, we can still agree that when a Christian does something like David did, their fellowship with God is broken. When your fellowship with God is broken, one of the things that David feared was that God would absolutely remove his Holy Spirit from him and that he would be cast away from God's presence. And he says, God, please don't do that. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. When Samuel anointed David as king, the Holy Spirit came on him from that day forward. And David knew what it was to know the presence of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I don't want to be away from that any longer. I don't want to have that fellowship broken any longer. And so, Lord, God have mercy on me. Lord, cleanse me. And now that he's cleansed, I want to be used again. When a Christian gets right with God, I know that sounds funny, but when a Christian should be right with God, and a Christian initially is right with God, and generally is right with God, but when a Christian messes up and comes back to God and gets right with God, after you know that your sins are forgiven, you want to be used by the Lord. Lord, use me. Help me, use me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Lord, I miss having the joy of my salvation. None of us are expected to be on a Pentecostal, hallelujah, revival for 24 hours a day. But you know what it is when you have that joy of your salvation and when it gets dampened and when it gets wet and when it gets broken and when it gets crippled and you miss the joy of your salvation. If you've been a Christian any length of time, you've had times in your life when you miss the joy of your salvation. And you don't want it to be gone. You don't want it to be hindered or hampered. You want God to restore the joy of your salvation. When my salvation, my joy is restored, I can teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted unto thee. People can't get saved right now. The gospel can't go forward right now. The kingdom cannot progress right now. The kingdom cannot prosper right now. It's because I've sinned against God. There's a stopper. There's a damper on the line. Lord, I want to be cleansed. I want to be helped. I want you to use me. I'll be able to teach your word again. I'll be able to sing and praise God and dance again. I'll be able to teach sinners your ways and they'll be converted unto you. 
Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. I'm guilty of blood. I've had this man killed. I've done things that are wrong and it's eating me up. God help me. God forgive me. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Oh my God. Then I'll be able to sing of your righteousness. Oh Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Right now, the devil's got a gotcha hold on my lips. He's got a bridle on my mouth. And I can't praise God like I want to because there's sin on the line. But Lord, you're dealing with my sin. You're helping me with my sin. You're restoring unto me the joy of thy salvation. And now if you'll open my lips, my mouth, you'll open my mouth, my lips will show forth your praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Lord, if you wanted an offering, I would be glad to give it to you. But that's not what you're after. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite. Not concrete. We're not talking about Walter now, concrete. We're talking about contrite. A broken and a contrite, humble spirit, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Now he's not just thinking about himself anymore. Now his sins are forgiven. Now God has helped him over this valley of the shadow of death, if you will. And his sins are forgiven. Now he's thinking about Jerusalem. Now he's thinking about the nation. Now he wants God to prosper the nation again. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. It's like, Lord, right now, everything that people's offering, everything that people try to do, when you have sin in your life, and unconfessed and open sin, when you have sin in your life, it's like everything you do is no good because your sin has to be dealt with. You can come to church. You can try to lift your hands. You can clap your hands. You can try to speak in tongues. You can try to do all of these things. But when it's sin, you've got to deal with your sin first, then all that other stuff. These gospel musicians, Lord have mercy. I wish I could get them to understand. It doesn't matter how good you sing. You get your heart and your soul right with Jesus first, and then you think about singing. Don't be jumping up in here singing when you don't even know the one who you're supposed to be singing about. Have your soul and your heart right with God. doesn't matter how pretty your song is. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it can't be anointed. But if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, all of your songs are anointed. All your music is anointed. You don't say, Lord, anoint this music. It's already anointed because you're anointed. You have a relationship with Christ. David said they can offer these offerings, they can do all this, but until I get things right with God, nothing's going to mean anything. Nothing's going to do anything. You can come to church. You can drive back home. You can do all this. But it, unless we do business with the king, it's not going to mean a thing. You've got to come face to face with the Lord. God forgives the penitent. He doesn't forgive those who try to justify themselves. He doesn't forgive those who try to excuse themselves and their sin. But he does forgive those who seek to be restored and have a right relationship with God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful psalm. Lord, thank you for including in the Bible the good and the bad and the ugly. Thank you for including the mountains. Thank you for including the valleys. Thank you for including the men and women of God in your word who had good times and bad times at times when they needed to pray and get out of the valley, when they were men of passion, women of passion, like passions as we are, and they had shortcomings, they had trip-ups, they had mistakes, and they even had sin. But you helped them, and you helped them, you can help us. And I pray that many people would be helped and blessed today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this teaching session from Psalms 51. The title has been, God forgives the penitent. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you know Him as your Lord today. And if you have been away from the Lord, please return to Him now. He will abundantly pardon you. This has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.